Welcome to my world. Two escargot, pate, frise, two green salads. Okay, man, it's not here. Lamb chop, steak free. Shouldn't you be doing something? Two faux filet and a pepper steak. Come on, make the dessert. Chocolate tart, please. As a cook, tastes and smells are my memories. And now I'm in search of new ones. So I'm leaving New York City and hope to have a few epiphanies around the world. And I'm willing to go to some lengths to do that. I am looking for extremes of emotion and experience. I'll try anything. I'll risk everything. I have nothing to lose. Vietnam has an intoxicating beauty that extends far beyond the urban setting. Today, I'm off to explore the countryside. My good friend Philippe Lejeuny uh, pulled in uh, semi-unexpectedly last night. We're ready for uh, ready for adventure. We're off on our next leg. We are traveling south from Ho Chi Minh City, heading into the Mekong Delta, the rice basket of Vietnam, to explore river life and its cuisine. Philippe is a consummate gourmand, and I say that with the utmost respect. Philippe loves food. Come on. I don't think there's anything in this world that he would meet. Yummy. Oh, just half is good. He gets me into a lot of trouble, but it's always a lot of fun. Good. Go best. We're cruising down Highway 1 on our way to the southern city of Canto, about a six hour journey. We make a few pit stops. Bit of a jam up on the road. Clearly, black was not a sensible uh, fashion uh, selection. The terrain is pancake flat and deliriously green. Martha Stewart does this, though. Canto. This is the Vietnam I've seen in movies. The scenery, the pace, the river life. In the air is fresh for being in the middle of the land here. How are we going? Look out, look out. This morning, we're slipping out onto the mighty Mekong River for a little breakfast. I think a bowl of extremely spicy pulp will, uh, might hook me up. When you're on a river in Vietnam, you get a real sense of the industriousness, the use of space, the engineering skills. It's almost an entirely waterborne existence. They check the gas station out. Slightly combustible, uh, you think? It's like a floating bomb, man. And I'll bet you 100 bucks the guy who uh, pilots that little buggy, bet he smokes like a fiend. There it is. Kai Rang is the largest floating market in the Mekong Delta. From fish to fruit to flowers, it's all here being bought and sold. Look at this. This is unbelievable. I'm constantly impressed. How do they do it? With boats that seem barely seaworthy. Not only do they float, but you can run a business out of the thing. There are little snack boats floating around with prepared foods catering to the merchants who work here. If you want a cup of coffee, you call the coffee boat over. Having a little uh, hey, floating Starbucks over here. I'll have a double latte uh, mochaccino, please. Starbucks really is in trouble because look at this coffee operation. They've got it all right there. Very cool. Absolutely steaming hot, wonderful coffee delivered right in the middle of the river. out of Starbucks. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, kind sir. After a cup of coffee, perhaps a traditional Vietnamese breakfast. A nice steaming hot bowl of pho. Little noodle soup. Beef broth, wheat noodles, cilantro, bean sprouts, chopped red chilies, and a squeeze of lemon. I'm rethinking my morning Captain Crunch ritual. This is the best. The flavors are so extraordinary. It's the true home cooking. Baguette ladies here. They make king hell baguettes in this country now. Baguettes are one of the better contributions of the French occupation of Vietnam. Delicious. Despite the humidity, the baguettes are remarkably fresh, with crackling crust and tender inside. I've eaten some of the best baguettes I've ever had in Vietnam. It feels quite wonderful to get up in the morning, to get onto a boat, sail off to a market. It's great. This is the life. I could go to a market by boat every morning like this. It's, yeah. I could float around here all day, but this water junket continues. All right. We've got a date with a duck somewhere up the river. No more roads from here. It's get into a long boat, putt-putt up a narrow canal, deep, deep, deep into the delta. Everything laid out here so precise, and, and, and just every little ladder, every little walkway. Very efficient, very small. 
We are to be the guests of a gentleman farmer called Uncle Hai, who's going to make us a very traditional meal. Jimi Hendrix in the background. The first thing we hear is the feedback of an electric guitar, rather incongruous considering where we are. Sounded like some uh, experimental jazz. There we are in the very simple country home of Uncle High and his extended family. He's got a few kids in there playing electric guitar, noodling away on an ancient Fender Mustang. So we're greeted with tea and a plate of pear-shaped fruits called water apples. Mm. It's kind of sour. Very crunchy, a lot of fiber. Yeah, I can't wait to meet the deck. There's our victim. Sorry, fella. No, victims. It's for a noble cause. This is a traditional recipe created by workers in the rice paddies using resources readily available. You have ducks, you have clay, and you have kindling wood to build a fire. And the tradition continues. Really, as we'd say in French cooking, this is very old school. The duck is killed first, then wrapped entirely in clay, innards and all. And then it's placed on the fire. Barbecue is so, you know, last year. <laughs> this is very, very simple food. Not a lot of technique here. This is like a beautiful family experience. There's uh, five people working on this. You got the whole family involved. Five or six people are working on the actual duck. So this is an event. All of the people from miles around seem to be some part of Uncle High's extended family. Some of them incredible faces. And incredible characters. And as we wait for our duck to cook, more of them keep arriving. Now this is grilling and chilling. Kanto is a beautiful city in the Delta. An agricultural community rooted in hard work and physical labor. It's farm country. And I think every farmer in the Delta has come out for Uncle High's duck and clay. And here we go, you know, palm fronds. I mean, the flavors must be absolutely extraordinary. <laughs> I can tell from the look on Philippe's face, he's thinking new restaurant, Shade Duck and Clay. Maybe New York, maybe South Beach. My mind is racing right now. I'm trying to imagine how to do that in New York. All right, this is smart. When the clay is broken off, the feathers come with it. And that is pretty cool. When dinner's ready, they lay a tarpaulin out on the front lawn. We all squat down and they bring out the duck for me to carve. All right, there's a duck here. Oh, wow, yeah. look at this. I recognize him. They will turn him over first. Keep in mind, there's no cutlery, there are no napkins. It looks like I'm wrestling with the duck. Before he was chef, he was surgeon. <laughs> but I managed to get the legs off and the breast in fairly good tableside style, considering I've got a plate the size of a chiclet. First, I, I need a little, like another plate to put this. I don't know if that's how they usually cut it. They'll probably be talking about this for a while. Okay, now, here we get into the good stuff. This is it. Oh, yes. <laughs> this duck was definitely cooked without draining the blood or removing the innards. There's a little blood in there, it's cooked through. This is one of the best cooked uh, duck I ever seen. Oh, okay. Bravo. This looks delicious. The clay cooking method keeps it tender and gives it a smoky flavor. So good. The flavors here are so remarkable. Pieces of duck meat, the dismantled carcass, and all else that remains becomes part of an incredible duck and banana blossom soup. Rich in texture, strong in taste, it's real hearty. It's enough to feed the whole crowd. The smell is just extraordinary. There we go. Very rich, it's cooked for quite a few hours. And it's just remarkable. It's a beautiful stew right there. Uh, it's so good to be here. The deadly Mekong Delta Moonshine, which comes out in two cola bottles. This is rice whiskey, the local home brew, kind of like white lightning. Oh, that's 
good. Mm. I was looking at you, man. Oh, look at those twins there. Wow. Mm. This stuff is dangerous. <laughs> there we go. They're down to the stomach and going up to the, to the head. And it's even more dangerous when you're the lone American guest of honor. You're something of an attraction. They all want to share a shot with the American. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Calling us here. I'm honored. Some of them want to see how much the American can drink, and if he can drink as much as them. The guy who gives me the most trouble, though, is the one directly across from me, who looks as if he's 98 years old. He's blind in one eye, he has no teeth, and he can drink me under the table. This gentleman here, I like him. Okay, one more shot. So I must have had 13 or 14 of these things, and I'm dying at this point. And so is Philippe. Mm. I traveled 100 miles in, um, in about two seconds. It's an extraordinary experience that just gets better and better and more intoxicating as the night goes on. That's it. I've had enough. I have no question in my mind that he is the stronger man. There we go. And as it's dark, with a single light bulb, you know you're deep, deep, deep in the bush. There's a singular, riveting, beautiful moment during this whole meal. A man sings a heartbreakingly earnest song. It's absolutely enchanting. Looking over at the glazed look on Philippe's face, I suspect he is similarly affected. There is everything here. All the senses, beauty, the uh, sweetness of the air, the food. My belly is full, my head is swimming. Somebody take me to the river. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Tomorrow, Philippe's off to New York, and I'm heading north to the beaches for some seafood. But this is a night I will not soon forget. I've traveled from Canto to Nha Trang, a sleepy fishing community on Vietnam's south central coast. Life is very different up here. A little oyster village uh, where I had my first oysters a lot, feels a lot like this. We're going to see a culture that revolves around the sea and seafood. You know you're in the tropics when you're here. If I say it's safe to surf this beach, it's safe to surf this beach. I'm at the beach, so I'm automatically happy. I smell salt, I feel sand, and I see the surf. Surf this up. So after kicking around in the ocean, I'm ready for some food. I heard about this cool floating dock where you pick your lunch straight out of the water, and fisherwomen are going to shuttle me there. Uh, 114th Street and Riverside Drive, please. I finally get to ride in one of those round boats. It's essentially woven strands of bamboo covered with tar, surprisingly seaworthy. I like these women a lot. They have a lot of fun with the tourists. <laughs> and then one of those bonding moments happen when a gentleman disembarks from my boat. When he gets out onto the dock, he stumbles badly and almost falls into the water. And the two ladies with me crack up. We don't speak the same language, but we all know what we're laughing about. There's a shared joyous moment. Now, this isn't like that skunky aquarium at your local fish joint. This is fresh, fresh, fresh. Somebody feels like squid? It's all stuff they hauled in that day. You just reach in. There are lobsters, kind of like the clawless spiny lobster of the Mediterranean. Incredible looking crabs. A variety of fish still swimming around. Everything's still alive. I think I can eat all of that. Okay, I'm do one of these. A nice big lobster. Okay, we'll take this guy. Lunch. Okay, this may look like we're sitting down for a typical lobster meal, but we don't do this in the States. Jam a knife into the lobster's sexual organs. That's gotta hurt. Drain what is referred to as blood, which is then poured into Hanoi vodka. Cool, I could get it on this big time. And of course, it's gonna make me strong and uh, hey, feel good. The Vietnamese believe that drinking animal blood makes you more potent. 
tastes kind of like sour milk and vodka. Yeah, strong. It makes you feel strong enough to tuck into a serious seafood meal. Most of the kitchens in Yatrang are rudimentary at best, but the seafood is always first rate. Recognize him? You've been seeing a lot of that cradle to the grave food here. This is not red lobster. There's no butter here. Now we're tucking in with a little pepper loosened up with the, you know, a paste with some fresh lime juice. Yeah, that's good. This is fried grouper finished with a spicy red chili sauce. This is how the pros do it. Yeah. The good stuff. Oh man, that's criminally good. That's Almost all the tables you see, a large, large group, six, eight, ten people, all eating together. Locals and tourists, whole families, everybody's tucking in like there's no tomorrow. You make a mess. You tunnel after every good piece. It's fun. All the big tables look like this afterwards. It looks like Stalingrad after the war, with the shells sucked clean, picked over bones, stubbed out cigarettes, discarded bottles. Evidence of a good time. Detritus of an invading army left on the table. Everybody wins, that's what's great. Except the lobster. He loses. I'm staying at the former summer retreat of the last Vietnamese emperor, Bao Dai. He may be gone, but one of his royal dishes remains, the much sought after bird's nest soup. The soup contains hardened strands of bird mucus, which sea swallows use to make their nests. It's believed to be an elixir of youth. Choking down a bowl of mucus isn't something I'm thrilled about doing, since I still have that lobster swimming around in my stomach. You know, I'm bloated. I feel like Orson Welles, but the chef's been working on this all day. So I have to extend some professional courtesy and rise to the occasion. What was Emperor Baodai thinking eating this stuff? Maybe if he'd eaten more at Sizzler and uh, less bird's nest, he would have, uh, would still be in power. Nest harvesting is a precarious venture. Harvesters rappel down rock faces to reach the nest, steering clear of the poisonous snakes. Not to be taken lightly, the highly prized bird's nest, which is no bigger than a child's hand, is rare and difficult to obtain. The motivation for risking life and limb is the high return on nest. It can fetch up to 4,000 bucks a pound. This is a slight incline, but believe me, it feels like Kilimanjaro to me. Fortunately, I won't be choking down bird's mucus right away. Bird's nest soup involves a lengthy preparation. So here's how this royal dish breaks down. A swallow's nest, quail eggs, rock doves, medicinal herbs, and a coconut. First, drain the juice. Separate the strands of the bird's nest, hard cook and peel eggs, chop rock doves. Season with salt, pepper, shallots, ginger. Soak the medicinal elements, wolfberry, lotus root, and silver ear mushrooms. Pack all the ingredients into coconut. Add back the juice as a base for the broth. Then steam for five hours. Bird's nest soup is highly revered as traditional Chinese medicine. You know, maybe this stuff will work. Because it cures God knows what. My lungs will clear up. Because it makes you strong. No problem exercising. And because it has therapeutic and restorative qualities. Give me that clear porcelain complexion I always dreamed of. This could usher in a whole new period of my life. This could be a good thing. Thank you. Ah, bird's nest. Okay, so the strands of mucus taste like overcooked angel hair. Actually, it doesn't taste bad. And the broth is pretty good, too. Sort of sweet and sour. Okay, so far, so good. It's the chunks I'm wary of. I don't want to know what that is. Please, God, let it be a chickpea. Tastes like one of those Chinese herbs, a little bitter. I can live with this. I'm, I'm relieved. So I'm getting past the mucus aspect and all the chunks. I'm thinking I'm home free. 
So you can imagine my surprise while tunneling through this stuff to see head and beak come popping out at me. Oh, yeah. That's our little friend. Yeah, I recognize him. That looks like a collarbone. I knew they used rock dove, but the whole thing? It's like something out of Evil Dead. That's a real kappa. The broth was the best part, and the nest wasn't that bad after all. But I wasn't feeling too good after this stuff. It did not make me feel stronger. Oh, I just feel utterly horrible. Oh, how do you say bromo seltzer in Vietnamese? Oh. It made me want to die. The horror. The horror. Oh. Never mind my moaning. Yeah. I've been completely seduced by the Vietnamese cuisine and the life that surrounds it.